Hi guys, I hope you're all well. I'm Lucy for those of you that don't know me. So today I thought I would sit and do a little video about my son Harry. I had a couple of requests to do videos about how he is getting on with his ears. I thought that I needed to take it back to the beginning because I know a lot of you are new subscribers or you may not have read my blog or followed my Instagram for a while. So you may not know that my son Harry was born deaf and he has what we call his magic ears. Um, so he was implanted at 14 months with cochlear implants, so he can now hear. So I thought instead of jumping straight into the update and how he's getting on, I would take it right back to the beginning and tell you guys a bit about what it was like when we found out Harry was deaf and our journey up until he got cochlear implants. I hope this video isn't going to be too long winded, I'm going to try and cut it to as short as I can because obviously it was a really long journey for us. I just thought it might be good for anyone that's going through a similar experience to us or if you just want to understand a little bit more about what it's like to have a deaf child. So I had a completely normal pregnancy, I was miserable, <laughs> uh, tired and fat. Um, yeah, everything was completely normal when I was pregnant. I didn't have any unusual symptoms of anything. Uh, I wasn't unwell as such. Um, I was just had a normal pregnancy and I had a relatively uncomplicated labour. I mean, it was like awful and really painful, but it was relatively, uh, relatively uncomplicated. I didn't have any real problem. Harry was born and obviously we were just completely in love with this tiny little thing that we had created and we were in our newborn bubble just like every other mum and dad. I think Harry was about one week old or maybe a few days old and a health visitor came to see us and she did what's called the newborn hearing screening which is a little hearing test here in the UK. I'm not sure how it works in other countries um, but in the UK all newborns now have a hearing screening and this has only been happening for the last 10 years I believe. Sometimes they do the hearing screening in hospital like straight after they're born but in our hospital they don't do that and they come a few days later or a week later after you've had your baby and they do the hearing test. Basically they put these little earphones in your baby's ears, they're really really tiny and they don't hurt or anything, they put them in their ears and they test for responses in both sides. So Harry failed this test and the health visitor said, don't worry, most newborn babies fail it because they have mucus in their ears, I'll come back in a few days. So she came back in a few days, did the test again and he failed. And she was like, don't worry about it, this happens all the time, we just need to refer you to the hospital because they have a better machine, it's a little bit more sensitive. She sent us to the hospital and we just didn't really think anything of it. Harry just seemed completely and utterly, I don't want to say the word, but he just seemed totally normal. Like. I, I couldn't see any problems with his hearing and a newborn baby doesn't seem to react to that much anyway so I just didn't really see any problems, I wasn't concerned in the slightest. I think we went to the hospital when he was about a month and they did the same test again pretty much but with bigger earphones and there was I think I was like two audiologists there um, and they didn't really seem that concerned at the time but they said he has failed it again, he will need to have another test and by that stage I don't I don't think I I don't I don't think it crossed our minds at all that Harry could be deaf. I don't know, I just didn't really think every, anything of it. I mean we were exhausted, we just had a baby, we were just caught up in the newborn bubble and we just didn't see any problems. So they said to us we would need to come back to the hospital for what's called an ABR test. Harry was seven weeks when we went for the ABR test and I remember it so clearly, like it feels like it was yesterday. It's funny how your brain can forget so, so much from so long ago, but something really traumatic and significant, it really retains it as if it's only just happened. That's how this day feels. So I just remember getting there um, to Basingstoke Hospital at the audiology department and they took us into this room and it was a soundproof room and it was just so claustrophobic. It was absolutely tiny. It was like sitting in an ensuite and there was two audiologists there who looked really serious and it, you, you could just feel that this test was quite important and then my partner Scott said to the audiologist how many tests do you do a year of these kind of tests on babies and he said around a thousand and I think that's when alarm bells were really going off in our heads because a thousand babies in a year is not a lot. I 
I really was concerned then. So for the test, the audiologist explained that he would need to use an exfoliant on Harry's skin um, to basically scrub at these sort of parts of his head and down here and I think he had some down here and it was it was literally like a really harsh exfoliator and I just remember feeling so upset because I didn't want him to hurt Harry and I didn't want him to like harm his newborn skin. They basically had to do that so these sticky pads could attach to him so that they would stick to his head and they could wire him up to the machine for the test. So that was horrible, he cried, and he had all these sticky pads attached to him with all these wires coming out of him and it was just horrible, like a seven week old baby with all these leads coming out of him. It was it was horrible, like I, I, I won't lie, it was awful. This test, um, Harry had to be completely asleep, which was an absolute nightmare. Obviously newborns sleep when they want to sleep, but by seven weeks, Harry was a lot more awake than a, than a fresh newborn, so I had to keep rocking him to go to sleep. And I think that's something to do with brain waves um, and sound waves, so when they were looking at them on the screen, brain waves and sound waves can get mixed up, so basically they needed him to be asleep. I think it was about an hour and a half the test took, and we had to sit in complete silence, stay really, really still so we didn't affect the test, and I think we knew. I think we knew what he was going to tell us. We'd been sat staring at this screen and all we could see was a flat line and we knew that that line should have been like like this, like a, a bit like a heart rate monitor. It should have been like this it, when the sound was going in and it, it was like that. It was completely flat. So at the end of the test, the audiologist said, would you like a cup of tea? And to me, in Britain, I don't know if it's like this anywhere else, but in Britain that means we've got something bad to tell you, you need to sit down. So he got us a drink and sat us down and that was when he told us that Harry is deaf and he'd tested at, I think it was 110 decibels, which is really, really bloody loud. Like for most of us that would be like painfully loud and that was the threshold that he was allowed to test to and he couldn't find any response. We were just so shocked, like I just remember being so, so shocked, like I just couldn't believe what he was telling me. I felt like I couldn't accept what he was telling me. As soon as he said the word Steph, I don't remember what happened really after that, He everything was a bit of a blur, but I, I we were just so shocked. There's no deafness in our family, like none of us have hearing problems. Um, and. I just couldn't believe that I didn't know. I didn't notice. Like, it, am I a bad mum because I didn't notice? That's all I could, all I could think of. And so that very same day, he was saying to us, "Look, we really need to get him fitted with hearing aids. We need to start trying to see if we can get some sound in there." And he wanted to take moulds of his um, ears there and then, but I just, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. And me and Scott both just felt like we had to escape that room because. We needed to process what he told us. Thomas needed to grieve, and I know that sounds like a really strange word, but it was, it felt a bit like a grieving process. The rest of that evening was an absolute blur. Um, I just remember speaking to our family on the phone and telling them, and them crying, and us crying, and no one just knew, no one knew what to say, because it's not like they said, right, um, Harry has this, and we're gonna do this and it's going to be fine. They just said, Harry's deaf and he can't hear you. And, and that was it. Like, there wasn't any, at that time, there wasn't any resolution or anything we could do. I just think I found it really, really hard to accept that Harry had never heard our voices. Like, he'd never heard me talking to him in my tummy. And he hadn't heard me singing to him when he was a newborn or shushing him to sleep. And and that still makes me really, really emotional today. Like, he just didn't hear me, and I didn't know if he ever would would hear my voice. But when we got home, I think our family came round, and I just remember this overwhelming feeling of, I didn't want to leave Harry by himself. I just thought that he would be scared if he was on his own. I didn't want to put him down. I just wanted to cuddle him. And I know me and Scott just, just cried ourselves to sleep that night. It was... It was it was a hard night. The hospital were really good. They let us have a little bit of time before they did Harry's mould, so we weren't completely overwhelmed. So Harry got his first set of hearing aids when he was seven weeks old, and I've still got them here. Look how cute they are. 
They haven't got the moulds on, obviously, because they got really dirty, so we just threw them away. But I just thought I'd keep them, just because they were like his first hearing aids, and it was a little memory of him having them. I remember him getting his first hearing aids really well, and I'm smiling because it was a really, like... It was a really funny moment. It was like almost like a really proud moment because he got his hearing aids and he was so, so good having them put in. And I just thought he looked so cute. Like he didn't, they weren't like the old fashioned, big, like nude color, brown color hearing aids that you used to see. They were these cute little blue ones and they let us pick the color of them. And I just thought he looked absolutely adorable. And I just felt really, really proud of him. Like I honestly felt so proud of him. and. I remember just taking him out in public and people obviously noticing his hearing aids and they were just so lovely, like I never had a negative comment, everyone was really lovely and really interested to know like, oh he's so small like but he wears hearing aids and they just wanted to know a little bit about, you know, what, what was going on and I just thought that was really nice and I was never ever ashamed of him wearing his hearing aids at all. In that time though life did get really complicated and busy and I found that I was at the hospital a lot and because babies grow so quickly they need moulds done for their hearing aids really quickly but they were doing the moulds and then sending them off and then by the time we got them back to fit in his ears his ears would grow again so we'd be back in the hospital and it was like a vicious vicious circle and the trouble was if the moulds didn't fit his ears properly you'd end up with a gap so they would whistle and we'd just spend the whole time like trying to push them in a little bit further because we'd had these annoying whistling hearing aids all the time. And maternity leave wasn't how I'd expected it, I thought it would be all cost to dates, playing at the park, going for walks around town and shopping and naps on the sofa but I actually spent a lot of the time at the hospital, I didn't really get to say, sign up to any baby groups because I couldn't commit to certain days. Um, it, yeah, it did really affect my time off, I think. I had a really bad experience with anxiety, which I won't cover in this video, but I became very, very anxious. I think it was a lot to do with Harry's diagnosis. Um, it just took a long time for me to process it, I think. I wore his hearing aids till he was about six months old, and he spent a good couple of months discovering them and pulling them out and it was a nightmare. He was six months old and he could sit up properly and he could respond to things. They did a hearing test which he failed miserably but we were not shocked at all. I mean we knew that he couldn't hear through his hearing aids pretty much from the first week he got them. He just wasn't responding at all. There were like moments of hope where sometimes, I remember my sister came in once and she slammed the door and Harry flinched but he, I, I hadn't really thought about it at the time but he was laying on the floor and obviously the vibration of the door shutting had made him jump, it wasn't the noise of it. And I think I really really realised that Harry was completely deaf and couldn't hear through his hearing aids when we went to the Bournemouth Air Show and there's a really, really, really loud plane called the Vulcan, I think it is, and it flew across the sea and it's like one of the loudest sounds I've ever heard and Harry's laying in his pram just smiling up at me none the wiser. He literally had no idea. He could not hear that plane at all. So I think, yeah, we'd accepted that um, by the time we went to his six month hearing test. Um, that he wouldn't be hearing through his hearing aids. And obviously that was a really scary thought because we didn't know if there was any other options. When he did fail that hearing test, the audiologist then started to talk about cochlear implants. Obviously we had already researched them a little bit, but not too much because we didn't know if it was something that Harry would be suitable for. But they referred us then and there and said, look, we tried the hearing aids, we've done the tests that we can, we don't think he has any natural hearing, go for it. If it's what you want to do, then go for it. And for us, it wasn't even a decision. We wanted Harry to hear so, so badly. I would have done anything to give him hearing. So if it meant that he had to have an operation and wear equipment on his head, then that's, that's, that's the decision we made. I have actually written a blog post for Phonak, which I'll link below about how he came to our decision, if you were interested in knowing a little bit more about that. But after that, became a little bit more exciting because I felt like we had a little bit of hope and hope is everything. I just had this sense that I knew Harry was going to hear. Even though we'd been referred for cochlear implants, it's not like, wow, you can have cochlear implants and that is that. You have to go through a lot of testing and we'd already been through like a six months of it. 
My bloody bin men have just come. <laughs> so noisy. To do a lot of hearing tests. That sounds really silly because we know Harry is profoundly deaf, like he can't hear anything. But they have to test to make sure that there is no natural hearing there. His level of hearing is, um, is low enough to be able to qualify for a cochlear implant. It's all very complicated, but basically they have to prove that Harry needs a cochlear implant. There was also one factor that we had to think about a lot, and that was that Harry's inner ear, so the bits inside, and his cochlear nerve, might not be formed properly, which means that you can't always have a cochlear implant. And that was an agonizing thought, and I think we pushed that to the back of our heads and just tried to ignore it, because I felt like we needed to have that hope, and if there was anything to doubt that, then I think we would have just crumbled. Just ignored it, and just after his first birthday, he went for his MRI scan, which was horrible, again, <laughs> because he had to be put to sleep under general anaesthetic. It was almost like a practice run for the main operation. It was really, really quick, and thankfully the MRI results were fantastic. His inner ears are formed absolutely perfectly. All he is missing is these tiny, tiny hairs that are on your cochlear nerve that basically send signals to your brain that make you hear sound. Shortly after the MRI we were given an operation date. When Harry was 14 months old we sent him down to surgery for his cochlear implant operation which was a really really difficult thing to do but I would do it again in a heartbeat. I mean my son now can hear better than I can. He hears perfectly. We can whisper to him across the room and he will hear us. It's amazing. Obviously, going down to get him after surgery was really, really difficult. I will insert a couple of photos now of what he looked like. He basically looked like Macapaca. He had this huge, huge bandage around his head. His face was so swollen. His body looked all swollen from all the fluids from the operation. And obviously, he was really upset. Um, the doctors told me that he shouldn't really be in any pain because of the pain relief that they gave him but I just felt so awful, I felt so, so guilty that he'd had to go through that. By the next morning, he was sitting up with me in bed, eating a biscuit and laughing with his daddy like nothing had happened. <laughs> I'm gonna end this video there, guys. I haven't really told our full story because I wanted to do another video about when his cochlear implant was switched on. I have done a video of when he did hear sound for the first time, which I will link below as well. See, our story started off really difficult, really, really emotional, um, but honestly, I wouldn't change him for the world. Having a deaf child has taught me so, so much. I mean, I know some sign language now. I've met some incredible people. I just wanted to reach out to anybody that is in my position and maybe you've just found out that your child is deaf and you don't really know how to process it or you're feeling really sad it's okay to feel sad we grieved we were really sad for a really long time but we got past it and now our son can hear us and his journey has just you know it's been incredible so i hope you found this video informative or if you've watched any of my vlogs and wondered what on earth the things are on my son's head, that you now know a little bit more about them. Like I said, I will do another video a little bit more focused on his cochlear implant and how it works and what life's like with him now. But I'm going to leave it there for now and I'll see you next time.